whoever came up with, you know, don't bring your problems to work, it's it's kind of an odd thing to say because we are our problems. Like we walk and talk and think in our limits, <laughs> you know, and in the growth of our experience. So you're always like, you know, putting your stuff into the workplace. I mean, anytime you've had a nasty supervisor or boss, they're playing out their whole life drama all over you. When you need a big change in your life and career, how do you make it happen with consciousness and clarity and integrity? Let's talk all about it with life coach and author Laura Berman Fortgang right here on episode 359 of The Nurse Keith Show. Well, hello, this is Nurse Keith. This podcast is always about you, your personal and professional development, your career, the healthcare system as a whole. And I share education, ideas, very frequent diatribes, and even more frequently informative interviews with some of the most inspiring people out there in the world. I love having you along for the ride and I thank you for being part of the growing Nurse Keith Nation. And if you'd like to be a really active part of the growing Nurse Keith Nation, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Nurse Keith. Pledging $2 a month is super, super helpful. And if you'd like to do that and join a bunch of other people who are helping support the production of the show, that would be great. You can also pledge more and get some awesome premiums and gifts from me as my thank you to you. And you can also support me and the Nurse Keith Show and the Nurse Keith Nation by referring yourself, your dog, your cat, your colleague to Nurse Keith Coaching for holistic career coaching, specifically for nurses and healthcare professionals. And if you mention the show or Laura Berman Fort Gang, you can get 15% off your first coaching package. The show notes for this episode where you can learn all about Laura will be at nursekeith.com forward slash the word episode and the number 359. And Laura, it is so nice to have you here. We've had a great conversation. You're my fellow Jersey girl. Well, I'm a Jersey boy, but we're, we both have that <laughs> history and you live right in New Jersey, right near where my grandparents lived throughout my childhood. So it's really a place where a piece of my heart dwells. And I wanted to ask you, not about life in New Jersey quite yet, but I wanted to ask you, how did you enter into this world of life coaching so much on the cutting edge? Because you've been doing this for many years, haven't you? 27 years. I was a mere child. 27 years before anyone had even heard of what a life coach was, right? Yes. And there's there's some people out there like, oh, I've been coaching since before anyone heard of this, but I'm talking about formally trained, formally, um, you know, part of a burgeoning profession. And I had the opportunity to be one of the first 16 people to form the International Coaching Federation, which is kind of like the nursing board, you know, like it's the only entity that exists to put some kind of, you know, qualifying factors on this and protecting the public as well. And yes. so, yeah, I mean, it was a right place, right time kind of thing. I never could have predicted, first of all, that this profession would exist, much less that I would end up in it. But I had been an actor and became, uh, was no longer enamored with the lifestyle of waiting on tables and, you know, everything I had to do to keep going. And I, my intuition spoke to me. And I think this is important to your listeners because, you know when something's gnawing at you and you just keep stuffing it down and stuffing it down and, uh, uh -huh. you know, holding the status quo. And I just had this intuitive inkling to call an old acting mentor of mine. He was more of a business side of the business mentor. And I picked up the phone. It was back before the internet. I had to call 411, if anyone remembers, calling information. I remember that. Right. I remembered what he lived. 411, may I help you? Yes. Oh, and yeah. I remember he lived in Maplewood, New Jersey. And that's all I remembered. And I called him and I didn't want to tell him I had voices in my head telling me to call him. So just like, oh, I just wanted to catch up with you. You know, we're talking. And I said, I, you know, I think I'm at the end of my rope with the acting world and I don't know what else I would do. And he said, well, funny, I now I'm a coach and I can help you figure out what that is. So I was a client for two years before it even occurred to me that that's what I would like to do. Oh, so, so he just happened to be a coach and then that opened the door for you. Yeah, he had met someone who 
coached him and this person didn't yet have a formal coaching school. But when I came in to the picture, he was just starting this formal coaching school. So the same 16 people who were that were in the coaching school were the people who started the International Coaching Federation. That's really cool. And and so you, you've been an actor, you've been a TV personality, you're a best-selling author. You've written six books, yes. I think. Five main, yeah. mainstream and one self-published, yep. Yeah. And so you've done all sorts of things. You've been an interfaith minister. You've done so many things. You've done a TEDx, TEDx talk, which I believe has received over one and a half million views. So you've been around. Yes. And you mentioned a very important word to nurses just a couple minutes ago, and that was intuition. You said, you know, that when the moment when your, your intuition tells you something's not right, I think you said something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, nurses can really relate to that. Nurses talk about their spidey sense, you know, and often it has to do with like, oh, this patient's about to crash and I'd better go over there and do something right now. Or they just, the hair stands up on the back of their neck and they just know something's not right with their patient. So that's where nurses' intuition often comes into play. However, you were talking about it, obviously, in terms of your own life. Like you had a nagging feeling that something wasn't right. And what was it? What was telling you something wasn't right? Were there symptoms? Like, was there, I'm talking like a medical professional, what was going on that made you feel like, God, I got to need to do something different? Um. Well, first of all, you're, you're in that intuition that you, we share, nurses and coaches and anybody, and humans, it, mm -hmm. it tends to be persistent, but not in a loud, nasty way, like persistent in a, you know, gentle way. And, and um, mm -hmm. but it's usually missing. Like for me, it was, I was, I was missing the signs or I didn't want to admit the signs. So like, I was unhappy. I worked really, really hard. I did everything right. Right. You're supposed to wait in line in the rain and wait for that chance to audition. You know, I, I did not miss an opportunity to try to make it at what I was doing. And I was a union actor and I did travel and, you know, did successfully enough, but I just was on, I was miserable. I wasn't getting the results that my efforts put in. So it made me have to question if I was on the right path. And, you know, the big telltale sign was a very deep depression that wasn't brought on by any one particular event. It wasn't a loss. It wasn't, you know, having lost my health or anything. It was just depression hit hard. And mm. it was like one year down and one year, it was like one and a half years down to the bottom and one and a half years back out. And, you know, I just really knew that I was doing something that wasn't aligned you know, as much as I loved theater uh -huh. and I loved, um, you know, doing it, it just was, that wasn't working, wasn't working. And I wasn't willing to give it any more time and then be, you know, 40. I was, I was like 30 by the time I was fully out, but, you know, I didn't want to be 40 or 50 and realize, oh my gosh, you know, I stayed too long at the fair. So I got mm -hmm. out. Right. That's good. And knowing when it's time to get out is really important, isn't it? Well, I mean, if, you know, you're Nurse Keith, I mean, we have a nursing crisis across the United States and other places. And so I hear of so mm -hmm. many, many people just hitting, you know, hitting the wall and saying they can't do this anymore. And no kidding. Right. Exactly. Right. So whether, right. you know, acting, nursing, teaching or whatever it is, you, sometimes it's just like no matter how much you love it or how much you feel you're of service doing it, if you can't barely function as in your life because you're so uh, downtrodden or you become ill from it or whatever, then something's not aligned mm -hmm. and it's time to make a change. Yeah. And your book that I've read, um, know who um, it's now what? Know who you are, get what you want, 90 days to a new life direction. This is the revised third edition that I'm holding here in my hand. And it's a really amazing book. I highly recommend it to everyone. And we'll have a link in the show notes so people can go out and buy it because I couldn't write a better one myself oh, for, for transitioning. So people should just go buy yours and then I don't have to write one. <laughs> so, but, but the thing is you have this methodology for, called the now what? 
methodology. And you like to help people in transition, whether it's career, life, whatever, just different forms of transition in life. And what is it about those moments, like the one you experienced where you had that year and a half down, and then you had that time of bouncing back and realizing that you were going to make a change. What is it about that time in people's lives that lights your fire? Like, yeah, I really can walk someone through this. Well, what I know deep in my heart is like, they, no one's done anything wrong. You know, this is not like a flaw of their character or a weakness in their being. It's usually just being like, you've either outgrown something or you got on a certain path for reasons that no longer suit you. You know, like I only learned in hindsight 10 years after I was out of show business that even like, of course, being on a stage is fun and people applaud and whatever, but I wasn't there for that. I, I enjoyed that. But I realized 10 years after I left that the real reason I wanted to be on the stage was to cause people to think, to cause people to be moved, to cause people to like, if you saw a play where two characters healed their relationship, maybe that would encourage you to go home and heal yours. So I just love the power of the medium to make people think, shift and change their life. And so I realized in hindsight that look at that. I didn't have to do that as an actor. I can cause change from a stage or make people think or make people re-examine and make different choices in a different venue, different domain, different career. Right. Through a book, a podcast, being a coach, uh, a TEDx talk, right. being a coach. Right. Yeah. So I don't need to enter entertain anyone to do that. It could, you know, I, I tend to be entertaining. I like to think, but, um, That's very true. but you know, it was a different, yeah. so I, I help people look at the context of how they got somewhere and why they're not happy anymore in it. And was there something that needs to evolve? Right. So if we were to say, you know, you got into nursing because of the healing aspect, or you liked helping people, well, it doesn't mean you're at the end of the road. It just means you might do it in a different form. Mm -hmm. That's right. So it's, and good. Oh, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. it's about letting things change form, but but knowing what your core is. Your core, and in your book, you talk a lot about you talk about values, right? Personal values and why they're important, and why do values? I mean, I work with them with my clients too. Why are they so important in your world? What does it have to do that alignment slash misalignment that happens? Well, um, it's 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 what you bump up against every day. You know what I mean? Like if so, like if you're working someplace where your values don't align, like let's say you you feel like you have more integrity than the place where you work, or you value honesty, or you value. Um, education and you're some you work somewhere where they don't want to help you move forward in any way you never get to learn anything again other than your original job those are things disaligned with your values but also important and i mentioned in the chapter that you're referencing is needs like if you have a need high need for stability it's going to be hard for you to be an entrepreneur on your own right or if you have a high need for um recognition you could understand why you have a hard time with a particular boss or supervisor because they never give you recognition. So it's really understanding they're not converse to each other, your needs and your values, but your needs have to be met before you can live a life of your values. So if we even put that to like your basic needs, like if you can't keep a roof over your head, you're likely not going to be able to think too much about what you what your values are and what you want to put out there in the world because you're still in survival mode. Good point, right? Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? You need right. food, clothing, shelter before you can start looking at the higher order issues. Right, right. And, right. and then most of us have that settled, but then the needs become recognition or stability or um, honesty or integrity. And some of these things can be needs and values. And how you know one from the other is that needs are not optional. Like your ugly behavior will come out if you don't get your needs met. Mm. <laughs> Oh, there you go. Like being, yeah. So being like the mom, I mean, my kids are now reached their twenties. Thank goodness they all survive. But when I think of being the mom of teens, you know, if I have a high need for recognition, which I do, 
they and you know you make them dinner you save their neck and they need a suit at six o'clock when they told you at five o'clock and they don't say thank you Mm -hmm. like my need for recognition is going to go make me ugly it's gonna make me say something (laughs) sarcastic or it's gonna make me be needy Right. right so we have to have those needs met before we can really worry about like the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow of living a life around your values i see I see. That's where they're interconnected. Yeah. And, you know, you ask these questions in your book. You ask a lot of questions in your book. And I do. You ask, um, do you have emotional heaviness? Have you been stuck for a very long time in a pattern of yo yoing? Um, you know, trying to make matters better only to keep slipping back into frustration, malaise, and confusion. If so, there may be factors at work other than not knowing what to do with your life. What is it that's happening when you're feeling those, let's use the word symptoms, because most of my listeners are nurses. When those symptoms are happening, then you don't just need a new job, right? right? You have to go a little subterranean. So what is it you're looking for in your ecosystem that you have to unearth before you then go out to find maybe the next job? Right. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times people will think, well, a new job will will solve everything. But you really have to look at, you know, if that yo-yoing behavior or constantly having, you know, self-defeating thoughts or seeing patterns of relationship over and over and over. To me, that's a yellow to red flag that there's there. We need to do some therapy Mm -hmm. like that's needing to unearth a trauma or a um, emotions that haven't been fully processed. And that is not going to be your career coach doing that. That's going to be taking a step outside of that and recognizing some patterns, figuring out where they came from, healing some old wounds. And then you come back to the process different because you're not going to react to the same. You're not going to be triggered by the same things. Now you can really decide if it's your job or if it was just repetitive behavior because you were stuck in a a loop I mentally. See. Well, thank you for saying that because a lot of people who listen to the show or have worked with me, they were probably hoping like Laura's going to say, I don't need therapy because <laughs> Keith's always talking about therapy. And in coaching, I'll often say, you know what? This isn't psychotherapy. And I feel like we're bumping up against something and I don't have the chops, nor do I have the license to go there, but this definitely needs to be looked at. And we can talk about it a little bit. Like, okay, so this thing happened with your parents, et cetera, et cetera. But you need to take this to someone who can help you unpack this. Because I can point it out that it's there, but I can't actually do it. Someone else has to do it. Right. We're not the ones to process it. No, we can't. But we might find it. it. We might find it. Yeah. You know, and I can give you a great example of that. Yeah. Um, So I worked with uh, a, a gentleman who was made a manager because he was really great at his job. And it's not always the best to put someone just because they're good at the job to be in charge of other people. So by the time he becomes a leader, very insecure, um, very worried about how he's seen, causing a lot of personality conflicts with other people. And so I'm hired as the coach to help him be able to handle more people in his domain, more people he's supervising. So behind closed doors, you know, we get to talk about, you know, what what is his definition of a leader and where is he bumping up against things? And I heard something in what he said that I was like, is it mom or dad? Who did you have this problem with? And he's like, oh, definitely my dad. And I said, okay, well, I think you need to go at, to therapy and look at this. And he, he agreed that he would do that, but we still could work on some things around what is a good leader what parts of him does he have to work on, blah, blah, blah. So he did the therapy at the same time. And a couple of years later, he saw me at an event and he came over to me and goes, you were right. It was totally a dad thing. And I really worked with a therapist really hard. And it, I, you know, all that stuff went away. Like I'm no longer insecure as a leader. And I've, you know, we've succeeded in his department. And that's how um, insidious it could be. You know, we are just people. And whoever came up with, you know, don't bring your problems to work. It's it's kind of an odd thing to say because we are our problems. Like we walk and talk and think in our limits, you know, and in the growth of our experience. So you're always like, you know, putting your stuff 
into the workplace. I mean, anytime you've had a nasty supervisor or boss, they're playing out their whole life drama all over you. That's true. Right? It's psychodrama at work. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, my my sister-in-law just got her physical therapy um what is it called? A license or a degree? Or well, anyway. Yeah, it would probably be a doctorate at this juncture. Yeah. And the person who was her supervisor in getting this didn't made her miserable because they were an unhappy person, right? So that when you bring your unhappy to work, you make everyone else unhappy. So it's really understanding those boundaries for yourself. It's understanding, okay, this person's triggered by something. How do I avoid their trigger? But how do I not get triggered? It's all psychological. Mm-hmm. Isn't and, it? Yeah. You know, and coaching can only affect it at an awareness level and an action level. And if awareness isn't enough to pop someone out of it, because they like, there's some people like, oh my God, oh my God, I see that so clearly. Great, got it. Mm-hmm. And then other times you need to go into therapy and heal that that hurt place so that you don't tr- get triggered all the time. It's very true. And in terms of problems, you say on in uh, page one, actually, you have a quote by Henry J. Kaiser and it says, problems are only opportunities in work clothes. Yeah, they're a little harder to deal with. <laughs> yeah, they're, <laughs> they're just a little harder to deal with. Yeah. And, and there's a quote where you like to quote yourself. It's something that you like to say. It's How a very narcissistic of me. Uh, it's a Laura Berman Fort Gang aphorism. So what is that aphorism? Um, it's that career satisfaction doesn't come from what you do. It comes from who your job allows you to be. Hmm. So it's not ever going to be the job that makes you happy. It's that you feel like you can be yourself, that you're working out of the better part of yourself, that the job allows you to like yourself. You know, I, I just work with a gentleman who can't stand his job. And so he wasn't liking himself. You know, he didn't mm-hmm. like who he had to be in the morning to get the job done and to keep it. Oh. Yeah, And I grew up with a father like that, you know, and I, that's definitely why I do what I do. I mean, before my dad died, my, that, my first book was dedicated to my dad and he read it and he was like, this is everything you've been trying to tell me since you were a teenager. And I'm like, you got it. I had to, I had to write a book so that you'd hear me, dad, yeah. that no one should suffer to make a living. No one should suffer to make a living. Yeah. I had to go on Oprah for you to listen to me. <laughs> exactly. Right. To heal my teenage years. I had to like, you know... Get out there and sing this message from the high hills. That's right. And while we're mentioning Oprah, um, what were you on Oprah talking about? Was it this particular subject or was it something else? It was something else. It was it was with my first book, which was called Take Yourself to the Top. But they brought Mm -hmm. me on for a show about giving up something. It's so weird how I ended up being the expert. And Oprah wanted to give up saying the F word. Hmm. So... The first 10 minutes of the show was that, but I was on for 30 minutes of 42 minutes of airtime talking about how to give up, not bad habits like smoking or swearing, but more, uh, I worked with a mom that we did a pre-tape on another day who um, she just couldn't give up doing everything for her family. Like she never gave to herself. Mm. So it was a two and a half, it was a two hour shoot with this woman in her home and she kept trying to be like on TV, you know, very put together, wouldn't get real with me, wouldn't answer my questions. She was on TV and the crew decided to take a break or so she thought. And I knew the camera was on. Thank you. Acting, acting uh, years. Yeah. And so we had our real conversation when she thought we were on a break. And that was the 30 second clip they used on the show because we oh, finally nice. got it to be real. Wow. That's great. Right. Yeah. So people, you know, so when people are on, they don't tell the truth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And part of coaching, as you well know, is getting to the truth. It's That's not right. looking, looking good and, you know, doing patchwork on your true feelings. It's getting in there and addressing the truth, yet not at the therapy level. It's a yeah. fine line. Exactly. Exactly. And When we come back from the break, I want to talk about the overall philosophy of how you approach this and why 
the ways in which you advise people in terms of career moves might be seen as slightly unconventional. And we, I think we've touched on some of that already. And also other aspects of transition, especially career, because face it, I mean, we're two years into a pandemic, right? Biggest pandemic in a hundred years and nurses have been through it. And a lot of nurses listen to the show because they've been through it and they're looking to make a transition. Wow. It's the Nurse Keith Nation. That's right. So I'd really like to talk to you about that and talk to you about this sense of feeling burnt out and how do you how do you make a transition when you're in that kind of place? So does that sound okay for the second half? Oh, I'd love it. All right. Great. So hang in there with us and we'll be right back for the second half of episode 359 of the Nurse Keith Show with Laura Berman Fortgang. So now we're going to take a pause for the cause for just a moment. Please consider becoming a patron of The Nurse Keith Show, just like other awesome listeners who value the show so much that they want to give just a little bit each month to support the work we're doing here. When you pledge, you not only get the satisfaction of helping produce and support The Nurse Keith Show, you also get some pretty cool premiums and gifts from yours truly. Just head over to patreon.com forward slash Nurse Keith to read all about it. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Nurse Keith. And if you know someone who could benefit from career coaching with me, please consider referring them. And if they become a paying client, you'll receive credit for an hour of coaching with me. And there's no expiration date on that credit, so you can keep it in your back pocket until you need it most. And remember that you can refer as many people as you like and continue to earn those coaching credits. What an incredible deal. And please head over to nursekeith.com and sign up for my newsletter, which comes out regularly and brings you supportive messages, updates from my blog and my podcast, resources, and all sorts of other stuff. Remember, nursekeith.com, sign up for that newsletter, and you'll also get a free download from me as my gift to you. Anyway, those are my sincere asks today. So now, Let's dig back into today's topic without further ado. And welcome back to the second half of the episode. Remember the show notes where you can learn all about Laura Berman Fortgang and the now what methodology of coaching will be at nursekeith.com forward slash the word episode and the number 359. We're here again with my new New Jersey friend, Laura Berman Fortgang, friend of the pod. And Laura, we were talking about transition. And we were talking about all the ways in which lots of things can get in our way. And you and I also, I think, are in deep agreement that sometimes in coaching, we come up against that subterranean stuff and we can lead the client to the edge, but then we have to punt them over to psychotherapy or counseling because that's what the psychotherapist and counselor are for. And like I said, some of my listeners and clients are probably thinking, maybe Laura will tell us that we don't have to go to therapy, (laughs) but Mm. you, you backed up my, my claims from all these years. So I guess they all have to get into therapy anyway. um, Now, what is your book? 90 days to a new life direction and your methods for helping people in these career moves are seen as unconventional. And one of them might be the fact that you like to do what I do, which is you go a little bit underneath and find those subterranean things that need to get unearthed. But what else defines your philosophy and the ways in which you like to approach these life moments when people feel like they really need something different? Well, surprising to a lot of people is that I don't look at your resume. Like I really, I don't even want to know, you know, when people think that they need to tell me who they are, they want to send me their resume and I I don't want your resume. You know, people feel like it's one way for me to get to know them. And I don't want to see their resume because it's only a business case and a chronology for why you are qualified to do what you do now and probably do the same thing or something similar moving forward. So I don't need it. I ask people for their life history and I dictate how they prepare that life history so it's not a novel or the screenplay version. And then I'm looking for certain patterns and um, 
sticking points that help people really see why they made the decisions they've made that bring them to where they are today. And sometimes it's childhood stuff. I mean, really, a lot of times I find things before 20 years old that are formative. And sometimes the recognition alone is enough, right? We don't have to go back to therapy. And let me make a quick distinction about how I see coaching and therapy. Um, We're here in the present. Coaching is about taking everything that works to create a wonderful future. We're here in the present and I'm not functioning well in the present. I might need to go back to the past to feel full and complete in the present. So that's where therapy is. Go to the past to be okay in the present. Coaching is you're okay in the present, but we're going to create an extraordinary future. And that's the distinction that I make. I love that. So sometimes when I look at people's life history, I see something from the very far past. Sometimes it's enough to just analyze it, be aware of it, go, oh, God, I, yeah, I, I did. I decided at 15 I wouldn't be like my mother. And so that made me do this, 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 and this. And I don't need to be informed by that anymore. So, so many times we actually outgrow our operating system. Many times as young people, we make a vow or an awareness that we will not be or we will be or we'll show that teacher who said I was stupid or, you know, whatever. It's a reaction to your past. It works for you into a certain point and then you outgrow it and you don't even know to look at that as where to find answers. So it is unconventional to say, give me your life history, not your resume when we're going to do careers. And I'm looking for certain patterns, certain pattern interrupts, certain reasons why you made decisions, and also to reassess your old dreams, right? So I had the dream of being an actor, and I thought that, you know, went in the garbage. But no, many times those dreams, whether they came true or not, they have significance in the present, just in a completely different form. So I've even spoken at high schools and said to parents, you're telling your kid they, that they can't be X, Y, or Z. What did your parents say to you that you couldn't be, mm-hmm. right? We tell our kids, you can be anything you want until it's time to choose a school. And we say, well, how are you going to make a living at that? I'm not going to pay for an education as a musician or that, you know. So yippee yay yo you've been sold a bill of goods. And so where's the significance? Where do those things still matter, right? So you may not be able to be a ballerina at 50 years old, but grace and beauty may still very much be in your value system and in your DNA. And how do you bring that into today? Mm. So part of my philosophy too, is based on what I call your life blueprint, right? It's, it's an imagined thing that when I would have success with clients who were working in corporations and I'd never worked in a corporation and didn't have a business degree, what was I doing? Like I was reading their DNA, I felt, like their life blueprint. I was giving them a manual to themselves because no one's given us one. And so, you know, exploring values, needs, this life history process, why you've made certain decisions. So it's not therapy because we're not going to go and dig through the emotion of things, but it is looking at the past for the clues for the future. And that's what's unusual about the methodology. I see. So you can look at the past and learn from it in coaching, like a lot of what I do as well. You can pick out those pieces, cherry pick those things that you notice. You're just not going to go process you know, the pain of this trauma or that trauma. Right. But you can take that lesson and bring it into the present. And I like a few minutes ago how you characterized that that difference between coaching and therapy and how you're you're not you're not diving back into all that stuff in coaching but i like this notion of the life story and i i don't elicit people's life stories when they do paperwork for me when we're first getting started but i do elicit a lot of information and a lot of it is not career oriented at all traditionally you know and i do look a lot at values because I think it's so important and talk about nurses and the pandemic and people feeling like they're not living their values at work. And you've probably heard this in articles you've read, you've read in the New York times or whatever, or things you've seen on the news about nurses right now and throughout 2020 and 2021 as well, feeling like they are up against ethical dilemmas that they're they're practicing in a way that they were never taught to practice nursing you know they're they're delivering care that 
isn't really how care is supposed to be delivered. And it's pushed a lot of nurses up to their edge and beyond their edge. Some feel pushed beyond their edge physically, but I think a lot feel much more pushed to their edge emotionally. And it's an emotional profession. You know, when you're working with people who are dying or suffering, whether they're children or adults or elders, it's emotional. And that can trigger all sorts of stuff. Yeah. But when a nurse comes to me and they're feeling burned out, they're feeling like ethically they can't practice the way they want it anymore. I want to ask you just right here and now, if this person has always seen what they do as the thing they do, and they've never really seen the possibilities of what else they could possibly do, how would you help that person begin to to peel the layers back to see that there are more possibilities than that that narrow little window of what they felt they were capable of? And that was a long preamble, I'm sorry, but I had to kind of bring the pandemic zeitgeist into it. No, I think it's very, uh, you know, it's at it's au courant. It's very current. It's mm-hmm. at, of the moment, mm-hmm. and especially in your field and your listeners who are are listening. I mean, it's a hard, it's an awful dilemma because also so many um, folks in the profession have high sense of responsibility, and they think, I mean, I'm at the I'm at the point of collapse. But if I'm not here, who's going to do it? You know, or if, or if we have a shortage. How are we going to take care of people? So they they push themselves even further um, because they're they're healers, they're people of the heart, you know. They, but at the same time, we're not good to anybody if we're breaking ourselves. You know, you're going to make mistakes, or you're going to, you you know, uh, hurt yourself or your family by being burnt out. Mm-hmm. So this is a huge. It's really a huge call to action. It's a big comment on our healthcare system. It's a big comment on how we expect frontline workers in all the professions to behave. Um, you know, we we all take these people for granted, and then we're in a crisis and realize we couldn't live without them. So it's I think it's really a call to attention of how are our systems broken and how do we fix them and. As a nurse, can you do that from the inside? Do you need to do that from the outside? Do you run for office? Do you get into a nonprofit where you can bring different solutions? Do you, um, you know, take your nursing someplace more palatable for you? Um, and that's okay. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's scary to think, you know, if all the good people go, what happens? But we need to keep bringing up the next generation and do better. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's incredibly frustrating to be inside of any system where you can't do your best work. That's very true. Yeah, that's a very good statement. Being inside a system where you feel you can't do your best work. And I think a lot of nurses and other healthcare professionals and helping professionals have felt that they have not been able to do their best work. And that's where the ethical dilemmas come in. You know, the nurses, you probably heard these stories who they're in an ICU, the family can't visit, they're holding up an iPad so that the family can tearfully say goodbye because they can't be at the bedside. You know, all these, the stories are ubiquitous and and innumerable at this juncture. So you just made an interesting observation that, that someone who feels they can no longer work the way they they want to, or maybe were trained to, that they could run for office, they could work for a nonprofit, they could do other things, but still, and this is what I try to get across to a lot of nurses, they can bring their nurseness to the table, even maybe if they're not even functioning as a nurse, quote unquote, anymore. Have, have you worked with healthcare professionals and are there commonalities you've heard or understand that that you see your philosophy kind of really hits upon some of those, those key areas? Yeah. Um, it's not numerous amount of people that I've worked with in the healthcare system, but I, I can speak to definitely a few scenarios where it just seemed like there's only one way and I'm not getting to do it the way that I want to do it and et cetera, et cetera. But, um, 
being able to see that there's other places, even within the field, mm -hmm. where your expertise can work. So this is this. Let me give you a doctor scenario. This is not a nurse, but I worked with a surgeon who, through a series of political malfeasance, not her fault, she was really black blackballed and couldn't get hired, and you know, was very no, well known in her field and her specialty, but there was some bad juju. And there was her feeling of being victimized. And by the time she hired me, she was still sticking to that victimization. It's like, I can't, I can't get you to the next place from this place. Like you, you either need to see through the rest of this in therapy and heal this place. But she snapped herself out of it. And we started to look at what were her other areas of interest. And she was incredibly interested in artificial intelligence around surgery. So she moved herself into that field. Like her, she is a surgeon. She is valuable to the AI field. Just like you're saying, you you might take your nursing elsewhere. Where can you, you know, work to bring up the next generation? Or you, you bring your nursing to the new technology and be a consultant for what the mechanics and the engineers don't know. So there's still, you know, so many places where um you can add value and change the change the tra trajectory even if it's just the trajectory of your own life that's a really good example and nurses do move from let's say the operating room to training surgeons and operating room nurses to use a new technology for instance or they whatever anything related or even tangentially related to what they did. But here's my question for you. And healthcare providers are, it's not that they're a breed apart. It's just, it's a different world because when we go to medical school or PT school or nursing school, you know, we're trained for the most part to help people. Like we're trained to be helping professionals, putting our hands on people. Often that's literally what we're trained to do. You know, we start with the bed bath and then we work our way up to like the really high tech stuff, for instance. And what I find is that there are so many nurses who are capable of being intellectual professionals, meaning that they have intelligence and they have information to share, and they don't necessarily have to continue to work in a task-based way. Even though nursing is very task-oriented, there are plenty of forms of nursing that don't involve that task-based type of work. But here's my question for you in this regard. What do you do when you're a person or you have a client who has a very hard and fast identification with the way they've been doing things and what they were trained to do. How do you help someone really make that transition to realize, oh, yes, like there's the light bulb. And what do we do with that that's really strong identity, like the surgeon, you know, thinking I'm a surgeon, I fix people. What is it that you have? And to, I'm a famous surgeon a for famous a particular surgeon. thing. Yeah. How do you crack that particular mm -hmm. um, uh, barrier that can stand in our way? Well, I love that you use the word crack because it sounds like you might have read mm -hmm. chapter two. Because I, I have people compare it to an egg, mm -hmm. cracking open the egg, right? So mm -hmm. when you're identified with a, a certain profession or a role, that that's the outside of the egg. It's, it, it cannot be moved in any way until you crack it. Now, when we crack it open, we could fry that egg. We can scramble that egg. We can softball that egg, whatever we want to do. So when you have the identity of nurse, or you have the identity of teacher or the identity of even I'm just a mom, that's an identity. Or we need to crack it open and say, hey, what pieces are malleable, right? So you care you have knowledge, you, um, you have a, a whole language, right? Because of the, what you've learned how to do. You have soft skills and hard skills. And so how do we put that in a new container? How do we put that in a new egg? And that's how you break it open. Like you use the word crack. That's how you crack open the identity. And identity is one of the biggest reasons why people can't make a change. It's one of the three blocks to clarity, as I call them, that you're just so identified with a particular profession or role that you can't even see anything else possible. 
You know, and it's not just transferable skills that we're talking about. We're talking about, think of the shell as everything that can be taken away. Someone could take away the job, the benefits, the perks, but what they can't take away is your experience, your knowledge, your characteristics, uh, your values, how you care about people, what you know about people, what are the things you have observed, um, what you've learned about management. Like all those things are the pieces that no one can take away because they're in you. And that's what you start building a new identity around or a new profession or a new direction around those pieces inside the show. I love that. And yes, I did read chapter two, though I wasn't thinking about it consciously when I brought up cracking, but I did very much read chapter two. So I love that. So the shell is the, can you say that again? The shell is the, the, Everything that can be taken away. The things that can be taken away, whether it's- The title, the money, the perk. The job itself. The job itself, right. But what can't be taken away is everything that's on the inside. That's so really we have to beautiful, yeah. Disengage from the shell. Like you're not just a nurse. Right. You're not just the podcast host. You're, I'm not just the coach, right. right? I'm, you know, that was part of it for me as the actor, you know, like, oh, I was the special one in my family. I was the one who, you know, did cool things in New York City. And that was a whole identity. And you didn't want to give up that specialness mm -hmm. until you're like, oh my God, it's making me miserable. So I better give it up, right? right? So the identity is so strong. And it's a big block to finding your next step. Mm -hmm. And you just used a word, just used a word that I've written about and done a podcast episode about, about um, how just is a four letter word for nurses, but it's actually a four letter word for anyone. When you say, I'm just a mom, I'm just a nurse, or a nurse will say, oh, I'm just a med surge nurse, you know, and, or an ICU nurse or whatever it happens to be. And it's this way we have of, diminishing what we are it we 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 knock ourselves down a peg right and we're not stepping into to use a popular vernacular like we're not stepping into our power right we're not claiming who we are and i think what you're saying here is that you take away the veneer you take away the shell all the things that can be removed from you and what's inside doesn't make you just fill in the blank. It makes you, you, it makes you who it it's everything that makes you who you actually are and what you bring to the table, whether you're at home or at work right. or at the store or at your church or whatever you happen to be doing. And you, Laura, I mean, you've been an actor and you've been on TV. You're a, a best-selling writer. You're a coach. I mean, you, you have multiple identities, don't you? And they're all tied together by wanting to, you know, I'm an Aquarian, mm -hmm. you know, so it's like, it's all about improving the human condition. So it's just taken many, many forms. It's just taken many, many forms. And that's that we all have that freedom. If we allow it, we all have that freedom. Yeah. Um, you know, when you hear about people, I, I, I can't be any one thing. I don't know what one thing is. I'm multi-passionate. That's okay. If there, if you can find the base of it, if you can find what's the, the purpose behind it or how you impact people because of it, that's all that matters. Like I always look for what's that ripple effect? Like what do you cause in the world, whether you're in your nursing job or you're in your neighborhood grocery store? There's there's a way about you that is your ripple effect. And I want to harness that, right? So when I say that quote that we talked about, it's not what you do that makes you happy. So it's not being a nurse that makes you happy. It's who that job allows you to be the carer, the nurturer, the healer, the knowledgeable one. So we can move that somewhere else if that job no longer allows you to be all of that. Right. And that's those are the parts we want to keep. Right, exactly. And I'm, I'm dying to ask you about a certain concept before we go. And that's the concept sure. of the polymath. And a lot of nurses come my way. I have several clients right now who I think are true polymaths. And I've done a podcast episode on this. They're people who just know a lot about a lot of things and they have wide ranging interests. And they're not necessarily, I don't see polymaths as dabblers. They're just people who have a lot of interests. And I'm somewhat of a polymath. And they may not be expert at all those things, but they also have this kind of a far ranging mind. And 
Some people I find are very critical of themselves, especially those who change careers multiple times. You know, sometimes we will call them Renaissance people, just somebody who is like a Leonardo. You know, they've they've been an artist and an architect and a surgeon and this and that. Do you ever have people come to you who you've identified as these types of people, polymaths, Renaissance people, and they're really down on themselves because their mind is just, they see it as being all over the place? Yeah, they they see themselves as a, what is it, a jack of all trades and a master of none. Master of none, right. Right. But it's really like each of these things gives you something. Each of these things, you know, builds you to some kind of hole as in Mm W-H-O-L-E. But I, I try to help those people find the through line because there's usually a theme to all the things that grab your attention. Mm. And um, in my TEDx talk, there's like the strongest example is this guy who wanted to be a magician. As He was a magician as a kid. He was an architect as a young adult. He was um, in advertising and marketing and he enjoyed outdoor travel and he just was all over the place and he couldn't reconcile that he really just wanted to be out in nature. That's all he wanted to do. How am I going to make a living of that? All this is so disjointed. And I said, none of it is disjointed because a magician, when you see a magic trick, you go, oh, when you're out in nature, you see, oh, hmm. when you see an amazing building, maybe you've been to France for the first time and you see Notre Dame and you're like, oh, and when you are in your, in Times Square and you've never seen a billboard the size of a cruise ship, you also go, oh, so all of his, everything he was interested in inspired awe. Oh, that was the through line. That was the through line. Oh, Okay. And so if we find the through line, you find that you're not as disjointed as you think. You just have had multi-experiences of the same thing. Now, you know, if you do want to choose a focus, Mm -hmm. have it be something that inspires awe. And this particular person, I lost track of him for a decade. And one day I got an email from an outdoor travel, like outdoor equipment company. And I knew I hadn't signed up for it. And I was like, why did I get this? Why did I get this? I looked down to the bottom. I see his name. I'm like, oh my gosh, I think that's him. I emailed back and he's like, yup, it's me. I did it. I have an adventure equipment, you know, get out in nature equipment company. How awesome. So wow. it took him 10 years, but, yeah, he, but he, did he, it. he did it. Yeah. So it's, so for these people, and I get a lot of folks like this who come to me because nurses, Nurses are brilliant people, and I often get nurses who have come to it as a second or third career, sometimes in their 40s or even 50s sometimes, and they have cool. MBAs and masters in this and, and experience in that, and they almost sound apologetic sometimes for all the things that they've done. And I'm always like, that's, that's the stuff that makes you special. That's what makes you unique. Don't hide the fact that you have an MBA. Don't hide the fact that you were an actor or a writer. You know, that that's something that you can leverage as a strength that makes you stand out from the crowd. And those those pieces inform how that person approaches being a nurse, for instance right? Like I was an art student early on. I was, I did sculpture. I did printmaking. I did a lot of things with my hands. Then I was a massage therapist. I was a yoga teacher. And then I came into nursing. And even when I was studying anatomy and physiology, I would go back to my anatomy classes in my head from art school from when I was 18 and 19 studying anatomy and how fascinating I found the body. It did take me till my about 30 years old to make that connection and realize, oh, yeah, there is a connection to what I did 12, 15 years ago. So Mm -hmm. I really wanted to ask you about that because there's so many fascinating people and a lot of us have multiple interests. So your, your admonition then is to find the through line, to find that commonality that draws them all together. Especially for anyone who's down on themselves for thinking that they're all over the place. Mm. You're probably not all over the place. You just have very many forms for the same theme. It's like variations on a theme, mm-hmm. right? From classical music, variations on a theme. There's this, there's a theme, a theme and you're high energy and you don't, you get bored and you look for the next way to express the same theme mm-hmm. and that's okay. And 
you know, when you, when it's also later on in life, you know, if you meet an older person and you're just looking at a person, you think, oh, they're, they're old, you know, they can barely walk anymore, but then go and find out about that life. You know, maybe they were grew up poor, but then they were a dancer and then they married a rich man and, or woman and lived abroad. And then they sailed around the world and then they were widowed. And then they discovered that they're a writer. I mean, those people are just fascinating. Mm -hmm. And it's really the people that have done one thing, one thing their whole life are envious of the people who have had many iterations. So, you know, the grass is always greener and, um, it, it's just a journey, you know, mm -hmm. who knows how many times we come around or don't come around, but we only know of the one that we're in. So, you know, take the journey and make it as interesting as you can. Oh, thank you. That's, that's beautiful. And I really cannot recommend that my listeners buy, I can't recommend more that my listeners run to Amazon to buy your book. And is that the place where people should go buy it and write a review? Yes, go to Amazon. It's because it's an older book, you can still find it on Amazon. Okay. And you want the one with the red dot on the cover, the 2015 edition. 2015 edition, which I have here. It's the updated revised third edition. Yeah. And it's Now What? Know Who You Are, Get What You Want, 90 Days to a New Life Direction by Laura Berman Fortgang. And it is really an amazing book. I really love it. It's going to live on my bookshelf for, Thank you. forever. And it's really one of these very, very special books about careers and transitions that is it's very idiosyncratic in its own way because your personality comes through in it and i think you're an amazing person and i'm so grateful you reached out to me and we're going to have you back because you know when your next best-selling book comes out <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna have to have you back but actually seriously do you have another project in the works right now that you're in a place that you could mention uh, it, I do not. I do okay. not. So I'll have to get on it. Okay. All right. <laughs> and figure out what the next iteration is of now what. Right. And then when you're on Fresh Air with Terry Gross, you know, maybe you'll remember me and we can get you back on this show. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm more than happy to, but thank but Laura, you. And thank you. Um, where do people find you? Where is the very best place for people to find you? Google my long name, Laura Berman Fortgang. And you're going to get LauraBermanForking.com. That's the easiest place to find me. You might see Laura Berman, the sex doctor, but I'm not her. Okay. So you're not her. <laughs> it's the Laura Berman Fort gang. That's you. And are you also on yes. social media? I, I definitely mm -hmm. am. Facebook, Laura Berman Fort gang, or you might find me as Laura B. Fort gang on some of the other ones because they don't let big names be on there. Okay, so we'll have links to all of those in the show notes and the website, of course. And I want to do my best to embed your TEDx talk on the page. That would be amazing. Yeah. Is that available on YouTube? It's on YouTube. Yep. How to, how to find your dream job without ever looking at your resume. It's on YouTube. Okay, so we'll embed that in the show notes so people can watch that. And Fabulous. I'm sure it's fantastic. So I'm going to watch that too. So thank you so much. You are a wonderful person. And having this New Jersey connection is really lovely and thinking of you there in Bloomfield, Montclair, that whole area. It's really, it, like I said, it's a place where it was a little piece of my heart. So thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. And if you, if you come East, you got to let me know if you're in town. I shall. Well, there you have it. Thanks for listening to this awesome episode of the Nurse Keith Show with the amazing, inimitable Laura Berman Fortgang. The show notes will be at nursekeith.com forward slash the word episode and the number 359. And I really do encourage you to go to Amazon and buy her book, Now What? 90 Days to a New Life Direction. I hope you uplifted and let me try that again. I hope you feel uplifted and empowered from this episode. Take some inspired action, take some of what Laura shared today and apply it to your own life. And if you need personalized holistic career coaching, if you're a nurse or healthcare professional, especially look no further than nursekeith.com or call Laura Berman Fortgang. She might be the girl for you. So no no harm, no foul. If you want to work with Laura, just go for it. And if you want to become a patron of the podcast, head over to patreon.com forward slash Nurse Keith. I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. The Nurse Keith Show is a proud member of the Health Podcast Network, one of the largest and fastest growing collections of authoritative 
high quality podcast taking on the tough topics in health and care with empathy, expertise, and a commitment to excellence. They're at healthpodcastnetwork.com. The Nurse Keith Show is adroitly produced by Rob Johnston of 520 Art Podcasting and Mark Cappy Spiesen is our stalwart social media ringmaster. Be well, dig deep, seek joy, keep in touch. This is Nurse Keith saying adios from beautiful and chilly Santa Fe, New Mexico, and the inimitable Laura Berman Fort Gang saying Arrivederci from Verona, New Jersey. Verona, New Jersey. Thank you, Laura. Thanks to everyone for listening. And we will catch you on the flip side.